All right, thanks for coming. The last time Ari was here, we had a blizzard around 11 o'clock in the morning, so we didn't have any crowd shots, but today we can do that. So <laughs> I'd like to thank Ari for coming once again. Um, Ari's, someone asked me what he does. The list is too long to what he does. He's a little, does a little of everything. He's a gerontologist, editor emeritus of the Journal of Gender Studies. He's right now working with is it head, head injured people? Yeah, head acquired head injury. And he's also, I put on here, world traveler. So he's done a lot of things. The book is called Zeus, A Journey Across Greece in the Footsteps of a God by Tom Stone. So here's Ari to tell us about this book. And I'm going to be um, doing the uh, overheads here. So here's Ari. All right, so you got a bigger crowd. Thank right. you. Uh, uh, it's good to be back here and uh, at, at the podium. Uh, I guess as a uh, professor and a former professor, professor emeritus is a good word, um, and teacher of various subjects uh, in my uh, uh, short-lived uh, ex existence on the planet, um, this is always one of my favorite places to be because I have uh, things I think we ought to share and pass on to whoever is ready to listen to them. And this book uh, caught my attention um, about two months or three months ago. And it rekindled a whole bunch of things that I both had personal experience with as well as uh, professional experience. The name of the book was Zeus, is Zeus, and it's by a, a, actually a teacher uh, of English uh, and history at a college, an American college in Greece, um, about in the 60s or 70s. Uh, it was called Anatolia College. And, and Tom Stone was just smitten by everything about Greece, the Greeks, both the present, the past, and he even thinks about the future <laughs> of these Greeks. And so he, he writes in a very positive vein about some of the origins of the theories and the thinking flavor of the places that we are going to get a little bit of a insight into. So can I have the next slide, Joe? Aha. This is a map of the ancient Greek world, if I can figure out how this works. I'm going to point out some of the places that, oh here, this is the thing. Can you all see this little red thing? Okay, one of the places we'll spend a little more time at is the island of Crete, which sits about 30 miles south, uh, north, I say, of North Africa, uh, parallel with perhaps uh, um, either uh, Tunisia um, or Libya. And the island just due north of it is, was known as Thera. And Thera was the site of an enormous volcanic eruption in the 17th century BCE. BCE refers to before the Christian era. Um, Sparta uh, was located here. There still is a, a, a city called Sparta uh, in uh, the Peloponnese. This area is known as the Peloponnese. We'll spend a little time talking about this place, which is where the Olympic Games were first held and the reason for the Olympic Games. Uh, there is a temple of Zeus, uh, the remnants of that there. Ithaca was the birthplace of Odysseus, and the famous Odyssey uh, by Homer uh, talks about his return from the Trojan Wars, and that's in the western, or the, no, the far uh, western part of what is known as Greece. This is the Ionian Sea, not the Ionia area, which is what is now Turkey. Uh, Delphi is one of the main sites uh, for one of Zeus's sons, the son uh, named uh, Apollo. And it was here that the, the oracle uh, was created and gave all the various uh, predictions of things to come and things that have come before. Dordona was an earliest site. This is up in the area of Greece known as um, 
uh, Iperos. Uh, this is, should be further up, but the map is a little bit uh, distorted here. I, I have uh, uh, no qualms with the person who put this together, except that some of the locations are not exactly where they should be. Thessaly is one of the main provinces of uh, central Greece, and the northern tier of Thessaly is a ring of mountains, which is um, uh, uh, the summit of which is uh, Mount Olympus. And, and the mountains of most of the European peaks uh, are usually in groups of three or four. They're, they're, uh, uh, they're not just one peak, like you would see Mount Everest. Uh, in fact, they are, they're known as massives, and this particular uh, mountain, which is labeled Mount Olympus, was supposed to be the home of the gods, Zeus being the chief uh, god, the thunderer god, as they called him. And uh, the actual mountain area is, consists of three uh, massive peaks. And one of them is called the throne of Zeus. The other one is called uh, Mitikas. And you can scale those without having to be an, a, 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 an Olympic climber. And I did that back in the 70s. Uh, very impressive area. And I'll anecdote some of that as we get to that. Uh, just one, one more site of, of interest. This is Troy. Uh, there is no Troy today. Probably uh, the town of Bersa, which is in, we're now known as Turkey. Um, is uh, resting on all the remains of what they uh, uncovered about Troy. This is the entrance into the Black Sea, and we'll say a little bit about the early uh, area uh, of where these gods originated from, uh, and uh, I'll have another slide of the maps later on. Um, let's see if there's anything else of interest here. Samos, a very important site for Hera, who was the wife and also uh, sibling of the great god Zeus. Uh, these are many of the islands, they're just names, a few of them here. And of course this was Athens. And of course we'll say a few words about the Parthenon and Athena, who was one of the children of Zeus. And um, I think that's good for, for this slide, thanks. <clears throat> To begin then, uh, now that you've got uh, at least a flavor of the location, we're in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the temperature is a little bit warm. It's almost like Caribbean type temperature, but in the winters it does get a little colder because of the geology of the area. This trip was taken by the author and his wife across the length and breadth of Greece in the Eastern Mediterranean region, where this god, namely Zeus, asserted major influence in very specific locations, from where he was reputed to be born to his final demise in the mid-first century millennium. Uh, that's post the Christian era, as I call it. Uh, the modern equivalent of uh, Anno Domini, for those who have remembered the AD uh, BC uh, way of dividing the, the world in time. Zeus and his companion gods and goddesses and their progenies asserted influence over the better part of 2,000 years. Most of that is before the Christian era. We have about 300 years of which we have enough information to put together what the civilization of Greece was before, during, and after the Zeus phenomenon. Um, they called this god Zeus and thanked him for his bountiful and natural assets. Uh, the Greeks, the early Greeks were from the Caucasus and they, they migrated uh, further west and south over the Black Sea and they gradually settled from being uh, uh, hunter gatherers to agricultural people because it was much easier to uh, get food and maintain a stable lifestyle if you didn't have to travel uh, hither, thither, and yard for your food. And so gradually over the eons of time, and we'll talk about that in terms of the uh, periods. So can I have the next series of slides? Um, uh, this slide is another one of the blacks of the uh, uh, ancient area, but this focuses mainly further east. And it is in, let's see, where is that? Uh -huh. Okay, it's in this area here, 
in the Caucasus uh, and in the central steppes of Russia that the early gods were uh, created by nomadic tribes. And Zeus was the name that they used very early on. It wasn't a, a later uh, appellation for him. And then these groups migrated via the Black Sea, uh, via these various places, into areas that were broad valleys that were fertile. And of course, the Tigris and Euphrates River was already well uh, uh, on its way at that time. This was the cradle of uh, the Mesopotamian world and what is now Iraq. Uh, and the Mediterranean here, Cyprus was a major center. Uh, over down toward this area, uh, there was uh, what we now know as Beirut and, and uh, Lebanon, uh, was known as Phoenicia. And Phoenicia was a major trading post with both the Crete area and Cyprus and some of the other uh, areas uh, going further west. Um, Cyprus was known for some of its minerals, and it's here that we see a lot of the mythology related to some of the children of, of uh, Zeus, one of them being um, Aphrodite. And Aphrodite was the goddess of love, as we are told today. And there was a whole similar set of names that the Romans used for these same gods. So if I uh, mention Venus, it means uh, Aphrodite. Or if I mention Minerva, it means Athena. So, Giving you again another um, sort of rough idea of how this area, this is known as the Anatolia or the uh, eastern part of Greece. It was known as Ionia in the ancient days and it was a major center for trade and for uh, learning. Uh, Miletus was the, the area where um, Thales, famous uh, geometrician, held forth and did a lot of the math early mathematics. Most of this comes out of the Nile. Uh, area. And this part is Egypt, and uh, the Egyptians were still very well known for all of their arts and sciences and all of the things that they contributed to the development of this whole area. Okay, next slide, Joe. And I'm going to watch my time, I guess, but um, whoops. We're going to go roughly uh, uh, quickly through this uh, chronology because without understanding the chronology, you won't understand the importance of Zeus. Uh, this is when Zeus is worshipped among the am amorphous uh, uh, speaking tribes of Russia, as I mentioned earlier, and he is known as a sky god uh, by the Greek speaking tribes. And then this whole era, which is about 5,000 5, years, uh, more or less, uh, until we get to this part where the Minoan civilization uh, and Santorini uh, and, and Crete um, uh, emerge. And they sort of become the rulers of the, whoops, what happened to this thing? Is that working? Oh, whoops, what's, what's oh, here we are. Rulers of the uh, civilization, uh, and um, because of their relative isolation until the great earthquake, uh, this was the main center of before uh, uh, anything happened on the mainland of Greece. Okay, the next uh, slide. Okay, we now come into the Dark Ages, and that's uh, for about 400 years. In this period, uh, very little really is happening of any note. We don't have even a written language uh, in which the Greeks could start to uh, uh, record some of their stuff. And um, when, uh, in 900 BC, the Phoenician-based alphabet is introduced and adopted in uh, spoken uh, Greek, uh, that's when we start getting the works of Herodotus, and the two major works that were around were uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, most of which you may have uh, had some familiarity with in your college courses in Greek uh, history. And um, then from then on, we, we begin to see a real upswing in the importance of Zeus uh, in the various sites uh, around what is now known as Greece. Uh, because the city-states uh, that were uh, always warring with each other for commercial gain and for advantage. Uh, they decided that at some point we need to call a truce, and if we have to fight, we should fight on the arena of, of the playing field or of the palestra, as they used to call it. 
and uh, we would honor Zeus at these, uh, these games. And Zeus, uh, a temple to Zeus was created there, and I'll show you a little bit about that later on. Um, and the two main works that we, we base almost everything about Zeus on, uh, besides the usual sagas and, and fairy tales, are Homer's two main uh, uh, books, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and Hesiod's uh, Theogony and the Works and Days. Uh, and then we come into the uh, Archaic Age. Can you push that slide just a little bit up, Joe? Right. And here we begin to see the emergence of Athens as a major player in the development of Greek history and philosophy and all of the other uh, activities. So the next slide, Joe. Okay, about the 490 to about 460, uh, 399, this is one of the major periods which most people study because we have documentation for this. We have not only archaeological evidence, but we also have some of the sites uh, as well as the histories by some very well-known Greek scholars, Xenophanes, Thucydides, Miltaides, and of course Plato. These are just a few of the names. Uh, uh, but all during this reign, Zeus becomes a major player in the theology of the ancients. And it's not just uh, him, but his progeny. Uh, Athena is an important goddess. Uh, um, Apollo is an important god. Th Artemis and so on. And I'll show you some of the uh, sort of what I, what I call the flowcharts, the genealogical flowcharts, uh, how these things sort of play out. Um, in 399, we are told that Socrates uh, was uh, convicted by the state for uh, being a traitor, uh, and there's lots of stories about why he decided to take the hemlock and that sort of thing. Um, this is uh, an important piece because then Greece reverts into the next slide, Joe. Uh, and we gradually see the, uh, the change in power from Athens to Greece, uh, to, uh, to Sparta, and a different kind of city-state, more militaristic, much more involved with war, and uh, following the uh, um, dictates of the god of war, who was Ares. And Ares was the son of Zeus and Hera. And so uh, we'll talk about a little bit of that. And then the, the most important sacred uh, 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 domain in, in the uh, period between uh, 360 and 346 uh, was Delphi. And people from the north under the reign of the Macedonian king Philip uh, began to uh, invade some of this stuff. And at the, this battle, uh, Philip and the son, 18-year-old Alexander, defeat Athens and Thebes, they control all of Greece, install golden ivory statues of the Macedonian line opposite Zeus's temple at Olympia. And uh, then, of course, uh, we follow the period of Alexander the Great, and as he travels all the way to the Indus River, there is an awful lot of uh, a cultural left uh, behind as he loses his uh, domain by dying uh, after 30 years of fighting the wars with the various states, including Persia. And Persia figures again in our society and in modern-day Iran. If you think about uh, the always conflicts between the Middle East, it's usually the Persians who have been uh, quite uh, warlike in some ways, trying to uh, uh, convince the people uh, both on the Western Front and the Eastern Front, that's as far as China, uh, to um, look at their lifestyle and their gods as the superior beings. And uh, Alexander left uh, many marks. Uh, if you travel uh, uh, any of the sites between, um, I'd say, Constantinople and parts of Egypt and all along the what we used to know as the old Silk Route, you uh, will find sites uh, with uh, epitaphs, stelae, artifacts from the times of Alexander's conquest of these places. Many of them are in the southern tier of, uh, of Turkey and uh, part of Kurdistan and part of Samarkand and many of these other places. So if you really are a traveler and you are intrepid, 
you could uh, visit some of those places and get a, a sense of what these places were like uh, 500 to 1,000 years before Christ. Uh, the, last, the last of the chronology that I want to be sure you're aware of, and this is the essence of it, uh, now uh, the Romans have uh, taken over uh, at the end of the uh, BCE, uh, that's before the Christian era, uh, and gradually they, they replace all of the Greek gods, goddesses, and progeny with their own set. They're the same gods and goddesses in principle, but the names have changed. And then the reigns of the various uh, emperors of Rome uh, and the rise of Christianity until uh, Emperor Constantine uh, in 313 declares that the Roman Empire has become Christianized. And then the Hagia Sophia, which was an important temple built um, at that time, uh, is, is a uh, temple now converted into Christianity. And um, if you look at the... Uh, the ceiling, or the, not the, I guess it is the ceiling, the arched ceiling of the Hagia Sophia, which is still uh, uh, standing in uh, Constantinople, it was called Istanbul today, uh, you can see a pancrator, uh, which was sort of like the effigy of uh, Zeus, uh, although it has the remnants of the early Christian teachings. Uh, basically, that was the image of Zeus, as they did it in mosaics in those days. Okay, so much for that. So I want you to keep in mind, as we start to do some of the thinking and, and reading here, uh, that the period that we really have some information is in the last 300 years of the um, before Christian era. And that everything we do is based on either uh, uh, archaeological evidence or on uh, stories that get passed down through the ages and the monks and the monasteries, both the uh, Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox are replete with these stories that have been painstakingly written down. And if you could read the ancient Greek or the ancient uh, Aramaic, you would find these stories as they've been translated into English. Let me say a word about the author now, uh, Tom Stone taught English and history at Anatolia College in Greece for many years, as I mentioned earlier. He's combined a twin passion for Greek mythology and history with his love for travel to specific sites in mind. He's written extensively about contemporary Greece, its culture, and its language. This is his latest adventure, tracing the origins and spiritual influences of the Greek god Zeus for over 2,000 years. The greater part of what is written, is about, uh, written about Zeus is the result of research done by the author over the last 22 years. Um, they rekindle, he travels to some of these sites, they rekindle for him a hint of the vast spiritual power that the thunder god, as he was known, um, had in this region. The author relates that he got a shadow of magnitude that many of the gods and goddesses are still there to manifest themselves. And um, at any moment, uh, and in unexpected ways. And um, there is a quote that I'll, I'll end with um, later on. But um, he was obviously quite taken by the sights and, and what we know about some of the work that was done. And what I am going to do is give you a little bit of the, uh, what I call the genealogy, so that you understand how Zeus fits into all these other godlike figures. So can we get the first one of those? This is a, a genealogy, and I, I'm uh, grateful to work uh, by uh, two authors. The name, uh, the name of the book is called Classical Mythology, and they did this sort of genealogical chart. On the top here, we see uh, Kronos and uh, Rhea. Those are the uh, parents of all, oh, here we are. Uh, Kronos and Rhea. This is from the first Titans, the first group of so-called deities that emerge uh, in uh, 7,000 7, BC. 
And out of this uh, um, sort of relationship come these gods, Hestia, Hades, Poseidon, Demeter, Hera, and Zeus. And Zeus is the youngest of the gods, and he emerges as being the uh, senior member of the clan of the gods that inhabit uh, Mount Olympus. And the story goes that Cronus was very fearful that one of his sons would kill him and take over the throne. So instead of having that happen, the legend goes that he swallowed each of the ch children that Rhea had produced in their relationship, and, and all these were in his belly. And of course, uh, being this uh, sort of mythology, uh, they didn't get digested, they just rested there, and he was protected until Zeus. Rhea was concerned about this, and so what she did was consult uh, the Gia, or Gaia, uh, Mother Earth, and say, I do not want my next child to be eaten up by my husband, Kronos. And so what the story is that uh, she got whisked away to go to Crete. And on Crete, she is, uh, she's uh, led to this wonderful temple, which is basically a cave on the highest mountain in Crete, uh, and, and she's able to have her son. When uh, Kronos hears that she's given birth to this son, uh, he's out to try and destroy this son before this son will destroy him. However, uh, Rhea has also gotten a message from Gaia that what she must do is give um, Kronos a big stone in some kind of a birth uh, 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 contraption so that he will swallow it and think that he's swallowing this last son. Well, uh, Kronos is not taken in by that, and uh, the result is that he's out to try and kill his son. And I'll, I'll read a few pieces of that. But just to go on from here, out of this relationship, when these gods are freed, and I'll explain why that happens and how that happens, Zeus and uh, Hera, who is really his sister, if you notice, um, Hera is the queen of the gods, and the king of the gods and the queen of the gods get together, uh, brother and sister and man and wife. And there's a very steamy relationship that goes on with these people. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but it's all in this book, and it's very nicely written. Um, but out of the relationship between Zeus and Hera, we get three of the more important goddess, or less important goddess, uh, and gods. Hebe, who is uh, uh, sort of like a, uh, an ingenue uh, kind of woman, uh, she's the wife, uh, takes the name of Hercules, um, and uh, Hephaestus is the god of fire, uh, and he's not a very a strong and uh, uh, an important god except for the hearth, and he becomes in the, in the Roman lexicon Vulcan, and Ares is the god of war, and he's the one that's responsible for most of the conflicts that take place on earth, and so there's always this constant uh, dialogue between Zeus and Ares about which war to fight, which war to end, and so forth and so on. Zeus, uh, when he's finally able to, is a big ladies' man, so to speak. And here we see the, the transfer, and it's, it's very interesting to look at the god as something outside the uh, human experience, and the, uh, Zeus as a human uh, being, uh, having relationships with other human beings who are labeled female. And the first one of these is Metis. And Metis, um, uh, they've had several families, but most important was that between this relationship, they give, ra uh, they, they give rise to the birth of, of Athena, although it never ever get consummated because Zeus swallows Metis. And gradually over time, so the legend goes, uh, Athena comes out of the head of Zeus, and I have a black-figured vase that points out some of that uh, sort of thing. Then there is uh, Maya, who's another one of these uh, minor uh, goddesses, um, human form, and gives rise to Hermes, um, and uh, Dionysius is very important here uh, on, on this side. Where is this? This thing is a... Oh, here we are. Uh, gives rise to Dionysius, the god of wine, and there are a whole bunch of sagas related to that. But Zeus and Leto give rise to these very important deities, uh, Apollo, 
uh, and his twin, twin uh, uh, Artemis, who was considered a huntress, and Apollo, the god of rational and reason. So that's a rough idea of the chronology. So you, you can begin to see when you say, what, who are these gods and where are they from, it, you get an idea of how they've related. So move on, please. OK. What I'd like to do now is to read certain excerpts to give you a flavor of the book and uh, then uh, probably show you some more slides of things that I thought were useful. What the book did for me personally was to rekindle this whole f business of, of mythology. And when I was running trips to Greece in the 60s and 70s, I took groups of people to some of these sites. And if you are um, a real scholar about this stuff and you can get the, the sense of what the atmosphere was in Greece at the times that these temples were built, that these ruins are still there. And the, the guides that go take you around to Mycenae or to Olympia or to Delphi do a wonderful job of setting the stage where you can feel yourself uh, in this very hallowed environment. And it's all over Greece and parts of uh, East, Western Turkey. So let me read a little bit of this. Um, I'm reading from chapter five. There are lots of uh, uh, chapters in this thing that have wonderful things to say, but I can't read the whole book to you. It's something that I hope you will all take and read yourself. Um, let's see, where am I here? Uh, I'm going to page 39 here, if I can find it. Okay. In the beginning, there had been a yawning emptiness of chaos, and as well the first beings of the cosmos, earth, hell, and love. Love, whose name was Eros, was the most powerful of them all. Barely pubescent, half girl, half boy, known in the Greek lexicon as androgenic or hermaphrodite, uh, was incomparably beautiful, but as deadly and intoxicating as Egyptian opium. He unhinged the mind and inflamed the body, moving all things, mortal and immortal, to couple with one another heedlessly. He was desire and longing. He was creation. He was the world held together and made it go round. He was also blind. Eros made earth, whose name was Gaia, seethe with such fertility that on her own she brought forth a male companion to satisfy her desires. He was Oranos, the immense sky, who would arch above her body, covering it from end to end and showering her with fruitful rain. Through this agency of rain, Gaia began to give birth to all the other beings in the universe, including those giant godlike creatures called the Titans. And then it goes on to talk about where the Titans are. One of the Titans was Kronos. And Kronos uh, was um, uh, a very strange kind of deity in, in the minds of, of the ancients here. Um, she promised all of Oronos' power to any of her sons. She gave rise to seven sons who would use the sickle against their father. Her fa their father was, uh, um, who was their father here? Oranos, and uh, as she wished. Only one of them stepped forward, the largest and the craftiest of them all, and his name was Kronos. Kronos from the, from the trilogy up there about uh, uh, Kronos and Rhea. That night, while Oranos spread out uh, upon Gaia, satisfied with his usual nocturnal desires, Kronos snuck up behind his father and with a single quick cut of the sickle, sliced off his genitals. But instead of immediately tossing the grisly trophy over his shoulder, as Gaia had instructed, Kronos let out a howl of triumph and raised the severed family jewels above his head, unable to resist the temptation to bask in his triumph. As he did, Great drops of blood dripped down upon Gaia's body and immediately began to burn their way into her, blindly seeking nurture in her womb. Some of these drops would become giants of the earth. 
the Yenesis, uh, disguised creatures with legs sprouting, serpents' tails, who dwelled in the land of the burning volcanoes, impervious to death, even at the hands of the gods. Other drops ended up in the Tataros, where the Tataros is what we call Hades, or in the early days, that's what it was known as. Thus did retribution make its appearance in the world, with Kronos doomed to be the become the first to suffer its lashings. He was told by both his mother and father that although he was now king of the Titans, he would eventually be attacked and overthrown by one of his own children, just as he himself usurped the throne of Oranos. And, and then uh, talks about Kronos, in, in his futile attempt to try and prevent this, eats all of the children that he and Rhea have but they just stay in his, his stomach, as the theory uh, or the legend goes. And um, out of this, um, uh, the, the Titanus, known as Rhea, mates with Kronos to give him all these children. And the last one is Zeus. And, um, and here we hear the, hear the author's um, uh, commentary about his experience when he was on, on uh, Crete. Um, I'll read this little piece here. Uh, Rhea went into labor, as she and as she did, there rose within her womb a terrible burning and tearing sensation, as if this new child were in fact a beast, a monstrous as a fully grown bull intent on ripping her to pieces as he tore his way into time. The energy released sent such a fury, fiery light radiating, radiating out of the cave that it seemed the air itself might even be set ablaze. And he says, I can personally attest to the authenticity of this part of the myth. Having in 1978 witnessed a similarly awesome and truly terrifying phenomenon from the rooftop of a house I was renting in a town called Rethimnon in Crete. I had been awakened in the middle of the night by a noise that sounded as if an ammunition depot was suddenly being ripped apart by a sustained series of detonations. When I went up to the roof, I saw the sky above Siloritis, which is Mount Ida, was exploding with a thunderous crackling of flames that seemed to emanate from the peak itself, leaping back and forth from one roiling mass of clouds to another and growing louder and louder with each passing moment. A wildfire of lightning that was threatening to set the very atmosphere alight. It went on and on for perhaps 20 minutes or more. Then, as suddenly as it appeared, it burned itself out. And the heavens, after a few intermittent sputtering flashes, settled back into a soothing, deep blue darkness of a spring night. As I watched, I kept reassuring myself that it was only an electrical storm, but not the end of the world. I didn't figure the thought very comforting, and probably still won't, uh, wouldn't, I should say. Um, imagine than what the ancient Greeks and Minoans must have made of such a sight, one which they must have most certainly witnessed more than once over the many years that they were on the island. Certainly it would seem as if such a phenomenon were heralding something of great importance, perhaps even the birth of the god, of he who would someday be called the great thunderer. So here you get the, the flavor of a phenomenon that takes place by somebody who eyewitnesses and imagines what this would be like 2,500 years ago. And uh, uh, if you've been to Greece uh, when some of these things happen, and I can relate that one or two of these kinds of events have happened with me, uh, one with the honey, and I'll explain that a little bit later when I was on top of Mount Olympus. Um, Anyway, that's the story of how Zeus comes into being. And um, 
there's, there's a whole bunch of other stuff regarding how he uh, manages to elude being killed, and then he gets uh, reborn, and et cetera, et cetera, and his childhood, and on and on. And there's, there's a lot of stuff here. And uh, the um, author then talks about, he went up to uh, uh, Mount Ida uh, to um, see uh, what this cave that uh, Zeus is supposed to have been born in uh, lived in. And uh, what they found out was, one, that um, the guidebook said that it was just a 10-minute walk up a rough track. So we decided to forego lunch until after we had made our pilgrimage. Some 35 minutes later, soaked in sweat, jackets off but sandaled feet, frozen blue from slogging through sometimes foot-deep snow that blanketed the final 50-yard stretch of rocky terrain, we at last reached our destination. The front edge of a gargantuan cavern that had housed the earthly birth of the great Greek sky god. The snow outside had been just a mild prelude to the mounds that were piled up within. It blanketed the 50 foot width of the entrance and extended down an extremely steep slope to what we could assume was the cave floor, at least another 30 yards into its shadowy interior. So he has this sort of experience, and then he imagines what it would be like to be uh, born in an environment like this, which is quite hostile, obviously. And um, then he goes on and talks uh, a lot about, uh, you know, that this is not a new phenomenon. We see this recur uh, in lots of other mythologies over time. Uh, but it's kind of unique because you're at the place where the people say that it happened. And then uh, he, he says something else which I think is quite nice. And what I like about this book so much is that it's got a humanistic quality to it. So you read this, and even though you're not in Greece or you haven't been there, he gives you the sense that you, you can get this feeling, even in the written word here. Um, when you drive down, the mount, down from the mountain and through the rolling hills and fields of the glorious Greek Cretan landscape, lush with all manner of flora and fauna, it is delightful to imagine how it must have been for the pubescent Zeus, as he too was brought closer and closer to human affairs exuberantly tumbling and frolicking over the undulant hills and dales of ancient Crete, across fields that were then without walls of any sort, playing hide and seek with the nymphs in the great forests that covered most of the island, um, resting in sylvan glades beside bubbling brooks as hot from the winds of Africa as the hot winds of Africa swept through the trees, making clothing of any kind, except perhaps the revealing gossamer wisps that nymphs like loosely twined about their limbs, completely beside the point. And, um, and so it is with this book. A lot of the things have this kind of romantic, historical, archeological, and actual experience of viewing uh, that rekindles in those of us who've been smitten by the legends and the history of ancient Greece uh, to look again at these wonderful uh, myths. Um, what I would like to do is, um, let's see where I'm here. There's one story that illustrates how this god operated. And um, it's an important story because out of it came the name of Europe. And the, the story is about a princess whose name was, in the Greek, they call it Evrope. And it's spelled E-U-R-O-P-E. -E. Uh, anyway, Evrope was a princess, and she lived in the land of the Phoenicians. Um, in the land of the Phoenicians, there was just such a creature. Her name was Evrope. She was very beautiful, very headstrong, and completely innocent in the ways of the world, having been brought up to believe that when you were the daughter of a king, particularly as one as powerful as Agenor, who was said to be a son of Poseidon and grandson of Zeus, nothing bad could ever happen to you no matter what. So on many spring mornings, she would lead her maiden playmates to pick flowers in a broad meadow near the sea, 
near the city of Sidon. And the city of Sidon is uh, close to uh, where we have the port of uh, Tyre and Lebanon uh, today. Completely ignoring the warnings of her parents and guardians to stay away from the shore, lest she be seized by pirates or a wandering god. Uh, this, thus it was that the eagle-eyed Zeus came to spot her as she frolicked among the flowers, her many-colored gossamer gown fluttering around her as radiant as the wings of a butterfly. And instantly, Zeus knew that she was the one. For the briefest moment, hovering in the wind, the god poised to swoop down in all his brute beauty and take her with his talons just like that, off to Crete. But she was so lovely, so young and so vibrant. Suddenly his feathers felt funny, his wings weak. They could hardly hold him aloft. He himself didn't know what the matter was, but Hesiod and the other poets, particularly that lascivious Roman Ovid, would tell us in detail. Uh, for the very first time, Zeus was being assailed by human feelings. He was, failing, he was falling, almost literally, in love. Okay, um, and so it was Zeus materialized in the, in the midst of a herd of cattle grazing in the meadow and was almost upon Evrope before she even noticed him. But when she did, she was enchanted. At the time, Evrope was barely in her teens and this bull, uh, Zeus comes down as a bull. Uh, seems to her to be about the same age, standing before her like a giant, like a bashful new pubescent boy. As she grasped in surprised delight at his sudden appearance, he shyly lowers his long lashed eyes and shook his dewlap as if pretending he was preoccupied with something else his well-muscled shoulders flowing beneath his pearly hide like water rippling over rocks in a brook. Then Zeus snorted softly a little more than a breath, and lo and behold, between the lips there appeared, as if by magic, a golden crocus. The powdery cloud of its saffron drifting upward to settle upon his moist pink nostrils turned them gold. Delighted, Evropi clapped her hands together, dark eyes flashing like star sapphires. She was easily the most beautiful creature the god had ever seen. Ringlets of her black curly hair seductively curt curtaining her face as she bent over him, skin as golden as virgin olive oil, her lips soft and pink as sweet briar roses. She took the crocus and in return entwined a chain of flowers between his horns draping a loop uh, garland-like around his neck. And as she did so, the great thunderer sank on one knee, seemingly overwhelmed by her presence. But it was too late. Evrope, taking this genuflection as a sign that she should sit on his back, hitched up her skirt and did so. Evrope was not in the habit of any way of uh, heeding the advice of underlings. Zeus then heaved himself to his hooves, and as he rocked upward, he seemed to grow much larger than before. Evrope, clinging to his back, gave a high-pitched giggle. The ground suddenly appeared much farther away than she expected. Meanwhile, her playmates began backing away in fear, and the herd bolted toward inland hills and the safety of the palace corral. Let me down, cried Evrope, but before she could even consider jumping onto the soft grass, the meadow, uh, soft grass of the meadow, the bull had bounded from there to a beach and thence into the sea, breasting through the incoming waves with all the ease of a great white whale barreling toward the freedom of the deep and he headed toward Crete, some 550 miles away. Um, it goes on and on here. I, I don't want to you know, make this a reading lesson, but um, dolphins appear on either side, guarding their flanks. A, uh, 
a procession of them like bridesmaids at a wedding, even thought Evropi drowsily smiling to herself, succumbing to the rhythm of the bull in the sea. That's the story about the bull from the sea. That's the whole story of Crete, uh, how, how the bull became the symbol of Cretan uh, power. Um, succumbing to the rhythm of the bull in the sea, she leans, leaned forward, entwined her arms and the folds of her butterfly gown through the bull's horns and fell asleep. So exhausted was she, in fact, that when they came ashore on the southern coast of Crete and the bull god let her slip from his back beneath a great inland plane tree, which is an important piece, I'll say something about that as well, Evropi slid to the ground with hardly a murmur and instantly fell again into the arms of hypnos. Hypnos in Greek means sleep. So uh, the Greeks used these various symbols and, and deities or sub-deities to describe human uh, frailties. Uh, soothing god of sleep, son of the night and brother of death. To Zeus she looked so innocent, lying there in the spangled shade of the tree, sunlight flickering on her limbs, that it seemed a shame to disturb such purity. But the great thunderer's energy, particularly as confined within the body of a mere bull, was up. Grazing down at the pastel gossamer of Ropi's gown, still wet and glistening like a thin film of oil upon her flesh, painting her body with swirls of color, the god suddenly let out a bellow of pent-up passion. Jolted awake, Evropi sat up, eyes widening in terror. What had been her gentle complexion, her savior was now metamorphosing into a giant eagle. Its imperial talons bared, wing, bared wings slashing in the air. Then he was upon her, forcing her backward, smothering her in the reek of his feathers. And although the violation of her body was over in a matter of seconds, the horror she felt at the shuddering of his loins would stay with her forever. As the eagle pulled back, Evropi spat at him, bit, um, bits of feathers floating lazily down through the dappled sunlight. Some of, the landed, some of them landed between her legs where a dark stain seeping into the folds of the gossamer shift that her mother, had it been only the morning before, had so admired on her figure, now already beginning to swell from the burgeoning of the three divine seeds planting within her womb, one of these destined to become the king of Crete. And so here you, you begin to see how the Greeks in their, their uh, theogony as well as in their thinking about how this all took place uh, developed this incredible story. And, and you could say, well, that's impossible. And probably it is impossible. But when you have an imagination and you really want it to have a good outcome, then it, it's not important, all the little details. And this is what constantly reminds us of how important uh, uh, the issues about how we really feel about our lives, even in the 21st century, uh, have some, some tether to the fantasies and the uh, rich heritage of our past. And I will let you read the rest of this, but I want to let, uh, tell you about one thing that um, was mentioned in this story about this tree. Because our, our, our author actually has an experience which simulates what he believes was the tree, that uh, inland plane tree that Evrobi slid down to the ground on. Um, <clears throat> As I was telling the guests about our project and mentioned the tree, the hostess, this is now, he's in Crete, uh, told us that it not only still existed, but happened to be just a half mile down the road. But you knew that, she said. No, I didn't. I knew that the place where Zeus supposedly taken Euro Europa ashore, now uh, the archaeological site of Gorton, was, um, was there, but I never dreamed that the actual tree was thought to be still flourishing. If so, it would be about 3,400 years old, an impossibility. Such trees, commonly called plane trees in Europe and sycamores in the United States, don't survive longer than 500 years. 
Besides, Gorton had been a major Cretan settlement since Minoan times, was, mere, was mentioned in Homer as a major contributor of the war effort against Troy, and during the Roman subjugation had become the most powerful city on the island, covering some 370 acres with massive complex of buildings, deities, Isis, and Serapis. Moreover, in early Byzantine era, 4th to 6th centuries AD, the Christian faith had managed to squeeze six basilicas into a little more than an acre in the heart of the city. So it seemed highly unlikely that all this activity, the tree hadn't been totally trampled long under before our own era. But of course, we had to take a look anyway. So we promptly left the party, hurried down the road to Gorton, hoping for the sake of tourists, the site would be open even on Easter Sunday. So inconspicuous is Gorton's entrance that we, spied, we sped right past it and over a small river before realizing that all the signs announcing its entrance were now on the other side of the road, <laughs> pointing in the direction uh, from which we had come. So we doubled back and pulled into a small graveled area by the main gate. Miraculously, a guard was on duty, seated outside, wooden table, uh, uh, on the gravel parking area. He was a pleasant looking, pear-shaped gentleman in perhaps his 60s with a full head of white hair, several gold fillings, and freshly washed Sunday shirt that sorely needed ironing. Besides him on the table was a battered portable radio out of which floated the faint undulations of an Eastern Orthodox liturgy. He gave us a bright smile and we stepped out of the car and said in English, closed. And then in case we hadn't understood, added geschlossen in German, thinking that uh, these were German, Germans are notorious about uh, traveling to sites and demanding to see them before the, anybody else could. Although he was pleased to learn that I could speak Greek, this did not make a dent in his iron refusal to let us into the site. Yes, he acknowledged that there was such a tree inside, and in fact, it was just on the other side of the ruins of that basilica. But no, we couldn't sneak into the site, nor even for a peek. Not on his watch, and especially not, he pointed to the radio on Easter Sunday. So why didn't we return tomorrow when it would be open? I explained that we had to catch an evening boat for Athens, and we wouldn't have time. Too bad, he said. I tried, I decided to try what was beginning to look like our trump card. Yes, I replied, really too bad, particularly for my wife, who is Persian, you know, and on her first trip to Greece. In an instant, everything changed. Suddenly, he, it was he, the guard, who was insisting that Farzana, that's the name of his wife, must see this famous tree. No, he still couldn't open the gate, but if we climbed over those rocks to the right and followed the fence to the side along the riverbank, we'd soon be able to at least get a look at it. It was just behind the Roman music center called the Odeon. We couldn't miss it. It was a huge tree. The guard grinned, very big like Zeus. So uh, here again, we see our author really getting enraptured by both the myth of these ancient uh, uh, stories and what he could piece together for his travels in Greece. Um, the book is replete with sagas, uh, not only from Crete, uh, but from the house of Atreus in Mycenae and from some of the other lesser things about Thebes, the Oedipus complex, and so forth. Um, uh, next group is section four. And um, here I took one of the uh, uh, great legends of the Minoan period. It's another legend about Ariadne. And Ariadne was a princess uh, at the time of uh, the Minoan, uh, height of Minoan civilization. And it was she who fell in love with Theseus and who gave Theseus the key to killing the monitor uh, the Minotaur, who was this half bull, half human, uh, li living in a labyrinth and eating anything that came into its uh, domain. Well, uh, Theseus was uh, set to kill the Minotaur uh, because he was such a scourge to all the other states, including Athens, where he had come from. So Ariadne uh, 
gave him a thread, actually some kind of a cord, which he attached to his leg as he entered the labyrinth. And the myth goes that as he traversed the labyrinth, calling out for the Minotaur, the Minotaur finally faced him and he killed it. And he was able to retrace his steps because of where the cord was. It was on his leg and it was attached to the outside of the, quote, labyrinth. And the labyrinth was basically the palace of Knossos, which was this huge palace that was dull at the time of the uh, Minoan civilization. And it was built in tiers. And then each tier had a number of different a avenues. So it was like an underground series of walkways. And if you went down to the lower depths of it, you could get lost. And that's what Sir Arthur Evans, who was a well-known English archaeologist, found at the turn of the 20th century. And he reconstructed part of that uh, uh, palace. And some of the frescoes were re reclaimed. It's a beautiful sight to see, but if you go with the guide, you really get the flavor of that. We, we, where have we come from? The, the Cretans did everything. They had sewage. They knew how to deal with flowing, running water. Their knowledge of things, and most of it came out of uh, probably Egypt, uh, of math and of science and of applications, building these huge uh, amphorae and things to store things, knowing how to deal with coolness versus heat. Uh, lots of things were discovered by this work. At this point, I uh, will entertain any questions. Um, I want to thank you all for being so patient and listening to what I have to say. I'm here for questions until another 20 minutes. Thank you very much.